Hello, and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I would go out tonight, but I don't have a stitch to wear. I'm Gary. Oh, I'm Linda. <laughs> <laughs> and today, we're going to review and discuss The Towering Inferno, which came out in 1974, from director John Gilliman. Ian, why don't you give us the synopsis? Well, Doug Roberts, an architect played by Paul Newman, has made a massive, huge tower in San Francisco of 138 stories. His partner, James Duncan the Builder, has cut some corners here and there, and electrical fires have started all over the building on the night of its grand opening. We also follow Michael Halloran, played by Steve McQueen, who leads the firefighters to try and save as many people before the tower collapses. This was a Hollywood first in terms of two mega studios coming together to produce one film. Mm, yeah. There were two books released before the release of the film, The Tower by Richard Martin Stern and The Glass Inferno uh, by Thomas Scortia. And both of those revolved around giant fires in high-rise towers. Yeah. Both 20th Century Fox and Warner Brothers individually purchased the two books and were both going about making pretty much the same film. And it's kind of a trend we see in Hollywood anyway, where you get Deep Impact and Armageddon, yeah, yeah. Bugs Life and Ants, where yeah. studios will compete with each other, but they realized that this film was going to cost a lot of money to make. So they both split the costs... Uh, and split the, the gross earnings for the film between yeah. the two companies. And, yeah, that was an absolute first. Yeah, I, see, I read that, and I was just like, why didn't they continue doing that? You know, we have all the issues, like you said, Bugs Life and, and Ants, you know, Dante's Peak and Volcano. You get these two films coming out at the exact same time with the same storyline, battling it out, you know, where they they did it with this one and went, let's just save some money <laughs> it's, just, it's just i mean the amount of money they must have paid steve mcqueen to be in it he got paid a million yeah. same as newman yeah. yeah yeah that's that before we even started the film i think that's absolutely brilliant both of them are top name stars in yeah. this film absolutely and they both were given the exact same number of lines well, but, Steve McQueen was cast first, and he yeah. was cast as the architect role. Right. But then he was like, no, no, actually, I'll take the fireman role. That's that's the real hero. Yeah, yeah. You can cast somebody else as the architect, and so they got Paul Newman. And famously, McQueen and Newman, there's a bit of rivalry there. More so from Steve McQueen, because Paul Newman is kind of like yeah. a massive celebrity. You know, McQueen yeah. is as well, but he's not quite at Newman's level. No. And so he was always competing with him, wanted to be a better race car driver than him, wanted to be in better movies than him. And so when he read the script, he realized that Newman had 12 lines of dialogue more than his. <laughs> so they called back the screenwriter to come back and write 12 additional lines of dialogue <laughs> so that both the actors would have an equal amount of lines in the film. I, I couldn't shake that from this <laughs> film to try to watch it. I was actually counting. Like, like every time Paul Newman would turn up, I'm like, Steve McQueen's going to be like right behind him in Steve, two seconds. Steve McQueen doesn't turn up until 40 minutes in the <laughs> yeah, film. Right. So it's almost the first act is... Paul Newman, yeah. the second act is McQueen, and the third act is the two of them together. <laughs> it's very bizarre. Yeah. But we've also got some other great names from the 70s. We've got uh, William Holden playing James Duncan, the builder. Uh, didn't he want, he now, actually wanted to be the top build. He, he wanted, wanted to be, to be the, the top building. He was yeah. like, I'm more famous than anyone else in the film. <laughs> and so, of course, they, they had to quieten him up as well. <laughs> With a little bit extra money. We've got Faye Dunaway playing mm. Susan, uh, Doug's fiance. Wow, that woman is very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> the dress yeah. helps. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, that whole opening sequence with, with um, Doug Roberts walking into his office, you know, on the tower, and he walks in. You don't see who's in the chair yeah. at first, but he plays it so well that he takes the hat off, and you're like, right, he, this person he, he's in love with. And then they go to a little bedroom in his office. <laughs> he's been in the door for like five minutes, and he's going to get laid. Well, it is her lunch hour, so... <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, it was her idea. I love the know. fact, though, that they've got bedrooms in their offices. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is not the first time. <laughs> no, they, 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 they planned for this. You've got, you've got Fred Astaire playing mm, Harley awesome. Claiborne, uh, a con man. Now, I only really know Fred Astaire from his musical yeah. dance yeah. numbers and things like that, you know, but he's a big name star. I mean... Was it Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers were two of the big names mm, back in sure, the yeah. 30s and 40s. Seeing him in this, though, it's a bit... 
I don't know. I just I felt... It, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Because the fact, like you say, he was a big uh, star for musicals. He actually got an Oscar nominee for, for Towering this. Inferno, which isn't a musical. Yeah, yeah. The, only the only nomination he ever and had. It's, <laughs> and it's almost like a oops, oh, this man's career, he's never been, like, he's done all these wonderful musicals and he's never been nominated. This is probably going to be his last film. Yeah. We'd better nominate him. It's, <laughs> yeah. It kind of felt like that. Yeah, because th- th- his scenes throughout the film, they don't... They're it's not n- mega, are they? No, no, it's not like he's the chief of the fire or the architect of the building. He's literally conning his way into this building to con a woman out of her money. Mm. So you think, right, he's definitely a bad guy. And the thing is, is that he lives throughout the whole, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the whole fire. Yeah. And he even gets told by the woman he's trying to con at some point when she's like, oh, I love you. Um, I know you're a con man. I know you're a con man. <laughs> you're not a very good one, <laughs> you know, because your heart's not in it. And I'm like, what? Yeah. Her scenes are better than his scenes. You've got the oh-so-brilliant uh, Robert Vaughan playing Gary Parker, the U.S. Senator. Mm. I love Robert Vaughan. He is always great, yes. but he has he has no real presence in this film. No, he doesn't. Uh, he has a couple of moments, but he's kind of overshadowed by everyone else. Totally, yeah. And, you know, his part was a lot bigger in one of the books, but because they were incorporating both books, his part just got reduced, reduced, reduced. And well, so yeah. when... You know, when he's on screen, you kind of you kind of forget that he's there sometimes. Although, he, is, he is like he portrayed as the, the good guy and everything. Yes, like yeah, that. absolutely, because so he's usually right. quite a villain. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 So that's a bit unexpected, isn't it? Yeah. But I think it's the problem with having so many big names yes. in the film, yeah. though, isn't it? They it was, can't all be having like these major big roles in it. It was funny looking at the behind the scenes where they realised that they had 12 A-star celebrities mm. in the film, and so mm. they had to build extra celebrity trailers outside the production set yeah. just to accommodate all these stars. Yeah. I mean, a couple other big name stars from the 70s. You've got Robert Wagner mm. playing uh, Dan Bigelow. Uh, he has a great scene. <laughs> <laughs> and you also have O.J. Simpson. Oh. Who rescues a cat. <laughs> well, you he know? did something, right? Yeah, he, he wasn't wearing gloves either. He's actually the one that first kind of like made them all aware, though, was, was concerned about the yeah. fact that there was something not quite go- right going on. Yeah. And yeah. tried to get them to look into it. To look it. into it, yeah. Because it, it slowly starts to build up. I mean, we follow Doug t- turning up at the building, you know, the biggest building in the whole of San Francisco. You know, it's basically... The biggest building in the world, I think it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's the home, what I, uh, the home, I believe, of Duncan Industries, you know, which is the builder's kind of company. And Duncan and, and Doug are partners, but Doug is planning on quitting. You know, he's just like, I'm done. I'm done living in the sea. I'm done building all these great things. You know, I just want to live out in the middle of the desert and do my own thing. And you're like, okay, so you're, you're setting up this balanced, nice relationship between the two heads of this tower. Now, just what the hell are you going to do at night in the middle of nowhere? Sleep like a winner. And then you have the, their test because they've got an opening that night for the tower. Even though everybody's already seems to have already moved in, yeah. shops are already there, yeah. you know, companies have already put in all their people, receptionists, everything is in this fucking tower before they've even done a safety check. Mm. And they turn on literally one switch and it blows a whole generator. And they're like, oh, well, luckily we were here to see that <laughs> because... You know, imagine what would happen if a fire started in like a, in a closed room or something. None of us knew. And then you watch a spark burst <laughs> from this junction box onto a bunch of disused rags in a room full of paint thinner. And that happened. <laughs> yeah, that happened. I, I looked at the, the time and that happened within the first 15 minutes of the yes. film. Yeah, yeah. And this is a near three hour film as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, which, is, which is really shocking. No, but it's good. It kind of, you know, right, so right at the back of my mind, you're going into a film called The Towering Inferno. Yeah, yeah. You know what the film is going to be yeah. about. You know? Yeah. But... And so what I like is that the fire is burning. You as an audience see the fire burning and then you watch everyone going about their day still. Yeah, true, And in the yeah. background, you just know that the fire is building up and building up and building up and nobody's really doing anything about it yet. Well, well the problem is though, and I, I said this, you know, the, the continuity of, of this film is, is shocking. It and is. the fact that, <laughs> that that happens during the day. Yeah. yeah. You're not quite sure what time of day it is, but it <laughs> yeah. happens during the day. 
we know that a fire like sparks on that in that type of environment in a room that would have probably gone up within about 10 15 minutes yes. yeah yeah that uh, would have been that room would have been fully ablaze yeah yeah but no not in this <laughs> no, no wait no. until nightfall <laughs> yes until See, the party starts <laughs> yeah this, this is something i've got i've got to point out i've done a lot of safety fire safety checks in in different jobs you know you learn where your exits are you know the extinguishers and the blankets and who to call and stuff like that throw all that out the window if you're going to watch towering inferno <laughs> well, I mean, it was set in the 70s, yeah. and the fire regulations were slightly more lax yeah. then than they are now, but this tower, still in the 70s, should never have opened by no. law, no. you know, with, with the lack of fire safety equipment in the in the building. Yeah, because it starts off, like you said, with O.J. Simpson notice, seeing that there's a fire and going, oh, it didn't trip the fire alarm. All the sprinklers. All yeah. the sprinklers. And so he's then going about himself testing the system. Mm. And Paul Newman is made aware of this information. And as the architect for the building, he's like, well, this shouldn't happen, you know. And, and Duncan's just like, we basically built the Titanic of Towers. This thing should never, ever collapse. You're like, that's a really bad title. Yeah. Hence, enter the baddie of yes. the film. <laughs> yes, Richard Chamberlain playing the terrible electrician. You know, oh, I, I'm not even going to tell you where I shaved off two million off your budget. <laughs> It's like, what, by not putting anything in? You know, he basically... Well, he built the building according to code, yes. regulation. That's what they keep But that was for a small building, yes. not, not a high sky rise like this one. Every piece of wire I put in that building is strictly up to code, inspected and approved. The code's not enough for that building. And you know it. That's why I asked for installations that were way, way above standard. Buddy, you live in a dream world. I deal in reality. Yeah, but and it also turns out that his father-in-law also skimmed money yeah. off different parts of the building as well. Yeah, but, but that was the thing. I, When I sat down and watched this, I always believed that James Duncan was kind of the bad guy. Mm. You know, he was the guy who shaved off money, you know, used his son-in-law to try to get past the electrical stuff. And then also, um, he didn't want the bad press when the fire actually breaks yeah. out. And so there's a sequence when Steve McQueen... Uh, finally turns up and confronts Duncan about it and saying, look, we need to get these people out of this building before you get trapped. And I was like, oh, this is where Duncan actually doesn't say anything, you know, and doesn't tell anybody. But he does, he does, he does tell everybody. So you're like, oh, so he's not the complete bad guy. You know, yes, he wanted the building open and maybe he cut corners a bit there. Maybe he was planning on going back and making the changes after. But it was Majorly Richard Chamberlain who fucked the whole place up. Yeah. And didn't care. Yeah, and did not care. And again, you know, according to fire regulations, even in the 70s, when the fire chief turned up and there was a party going on up there, it didn't matter if the queen was up there herself, everyone would have been evacuated from the building. Even yeah. though he says you can have the party on the ground floor, it just wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. No, no. And so if they had followed regulations, then they would have just got out of the building before the fire had done any real damage. Yeah, yeah. But then you wouldn't have had you a film. You wouldn't have had a film. <laughs> because I kept thinking this as well, like... When they finally notice the fire, um, you have Paul Newman rush down with his buddy to, to check on the room and, and they get that kind of original backdraft yeah. moment where yeah, he opens yeah. the door and the fire hits him in the face. And uh, I think his, his buddy's Will Jennings, who you don't really notice, but he does pop up a couple other yeah. times as talking points through the film. Yeah. And you're like, oh God, yes, I remember that. And the fact that the film's three hours long, I was I was worried there were far too many dramatic moments with people in the film like like i said you've got the whole will jennings bit so you've got him later on turning up you've got the deaf mum and her daughter you know who are going to and son. oh yeah with the son with the giant fucking headphones <laughs> on yeah you just know they're like no we're not going to the party we're just going to sit in our room and i'm like what if there's a fire <laughs> you're not going to hear anything no, we'll be we'll be fine. We've got OJ Simpson watching us. It's it's all good. <laughs> but you've also got Dan and Laurie. You know, you've got uh, Dan Bigelow played by Robert Wagner and his receptionist Laurie. Secretary, yeah. Secretary, receptionist, <laughs> Straight, mistress. mistress. <laughs> you know, oh, I need you for a letter while everybody else goes off to the party. Can you disconnect the phone lines and lock the door as well so that <laughs> we're like completely alone <laughs> and you know. Nobody will know we're here. Yeah, and they have sex and then realise they're surrounded by fire. And I'm like, 
So that's another group of people. And then you've got the family. And then you've got... You've got, you've got um, the mayor and the mayoress. Yeah. You've got the mayor and the mayor net, mayoress and the US Centre all up in the mm. party. And you've got Duncan and his daughter up there with Chamberlain. And then you've and got... And the firefighters. And the firefighters. Which, so there's a lot going on. You, well, which, you've got that title card at the beginning that says this film is dedicated to all these people. Yeah. Should have just kept it focused on them, I think. Yeah, but the thing is, well, you got to remember, 70s disaster. Yes, but yes, yes. Also, um, it came off the back of Poseidon. And actually, yeah. if you look yeah. side by side, those the two films. Yes. Actually, the themes running through are very similar. Yes, absolutely, massively. I, I, was, I said to you, didn't I? I said, actually, this film shouldn't be called The Towering Inferno. It should be called The Escape from The Towering Inferno. <laughs> yeah. Because it is, literally, it's... How many different ways can we get into this film of getting these people out? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah it is basically, all, and it's actually it's, it's all about the escape of getting out of the building. Yeah. yeah. Well, in both the two books, they both have two different escape routes, and both of those escape routes are incorporated into the film, yeah. which is the chair <laughs> going up the side exactly. of the building and the helicopter. Yeah. Which. Yeah. Which brings me to my point where I couldn't shake the point of Paul Newman and Steve McQueen fighting over each other, over who was going to get top billing. So it was like, well, maybe we should rescue th these people this way. No, 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 Paul, we should rescue them this way. No, 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 Steve, we should rescue them this way. No, 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 Steve. Love that rescue... line when they're in the elevator and he's like, you here to fight the fire or me? You know? <laughs> now, you know, there's no sure way for us to fight a fire or anything over the seventh floor. But you guys just keep building them as high as you can. Hey. Are you here to take me on or the fire? <laughs> He's like, mm -hmm. He's like, mm, architects. <laughs> but apparently on set, the two of them got on really well. They never argued or bickered or got upset with each other. You know, they hung out and had beers off set. Well, because so. they were mainly professionals. They were, and they, they acted that way as well. And, and, and I, I love that about this film is that, I mean, even though Steve McQueen doesn't turn up till 40 minutes in, when he does turn up, I'm like, that's the fucking fire chief. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's got all of his gear. He's got all of his his uh, his mannerisms. He seems pretty experienced. He knows when he looks at the building, even though it's a massive, huge tower that he's got to deal with, and all these people, he knows exactly what he needs his mm. men to do. And he's there on the sets with them fighting the fire. He's slapping on the back. Hey, George, I know you're tired. I'm going to try and relieve you. You know, give me that hose and you go off. So. It's, there were points where I'm like, is that actually Steve McQueen doing that? Or, or have they cut and stuck a stunt double in just to get He actually character? went out with a fire did, crew at he? one point just to get some training, just to see what it was like well, so we could get involved. a lot of the role. firemen that are in the film are firemen. Are yes, firemen. they, they, they firemen. hired 1,000 firefighters mm. for the production of this film. And not <laughs> one of them could fire at the base of the fire. Well... <laughs> I know the film it's would an be uncontrollable the, fire. You know, I know the film would have been over, the like, film that. Would have been <laughs> over like that. But literally, they, they get to the like they get to the fire and they're like, aim for the ceiling, get the ceiling, they get the ceiling off. I'm like, every fire thing I've ever seen is like aim for the base, put the base out. You know, there's not one extinguisher on the floors. There's no blankets. The sprinklers don't work. And literally, they've got one hose trailing <laughs> yeah. them through. And on top of that, you know. It's like when, when Steve McQueen gets called by like the Navy guys or different people. It's like, uh, yeah, where are you? I'm on the 79th floor. Well, we're in the lobby. Well, the elevators aren't working. Well, we'll walk up the stairs. I'm like, that's going to take fucking hours. <laughs> yeah, but he does point that out. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to set up communications next to the forward command center. No, no, too dangerous. Stay out of those elevators. Well, then, sir, we'll just trot right up the stairs. Yeah, you just trot right up to 79, huh? Standing by in the lobby, sir. So James Duncan has been informed that the fire is, is on the 81st floor and they have no way of knowing if any other fires may break out because of the terrible electrical workings done by Richard Chamberlain. So they decide that they're going to try and get as many of the people out of the promenade room as, as possible. And so they start using the elevators. And then Steve McQueen turns around and goes, whoa, 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 no. Nobody should be using elevators during the fire. It's fucking dangerous. You, you know, the doors may open. But he does. Oh yeah, yeah. He, he, he <laughs> Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen don't give McQueen, a yeah. he don't, <laughs> shit. Steve McQueen don't, ain't gonna die. But it's oh, it's the fact that they get all the people into the elevator. And I've got to admit, it's a better elevator sequence than Earthquake. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, because the elevator, you got all these guys just fighting this fire. And Stephen Queen takes the hose. And then the elevator stops on the actual floor where they're fighting. 
which is what he'd warned them would happen. Yeah. The elevator goes back up, though, to the promenade floor <laughs> yeah, and opens up. up again. I know, and one guy comes amazing. running out on fire. Hang on, I'm on fire. I'll just go back up. <laughs> <laughs> So all the people in the party now have been have seen. Oh, oh, oh fuck! There real. is a fire. We, we could die. You know, is there any way out? No, no. The uh, the the elevators are blocked. How about the scenic elevator? The the scenic elevator. Yeah, we'll take that. Well, I also like the fact that the stairs never take stairs during a fire, uh, because Paul Newman has has headed down to the deaf woman's apartment with uh, Miss Miller, played by uh, Jennifer Jones. To uh, to rescue Mula. them, a Mueller, sorry, Mueller. Mueller. Yeah. Mueller like rice. the yogurt, like a Mueller rice, <laughs> and <laughs> and they rescue everybody there. But um, I think it's O.J. Simpson rescues the mum, yes. yeah, and he takes her off one way, yeah. and uh, Paul Newman has has Jennifer Jones and the two children, and so they start going another way. They need to get either down the stairs to the lobby or up towards the promenade. And as they're making their way down the stairs, Paul Newman notices that there's a gas leak. <laughs> it's a rupture of gas line. Get back. Anybody want to explain to me how a gas leak breaks out on a stairway in the middle of a fire? There's pipes, isn't there? Yeah. How did the pipe break? Oh, we don't know. Could something could have because you know, the ceilings, ceilings are collapsing? The collapsing and... Exactly. <laughs> gone, gone down on you know. We've already seen several floors right. give way within the, right. the I, building. So. I, yeah, I was going to say, I know that we said that this building was terribly made, yeah. but gas pipes in a stairway that could easily rupture in the middle of a fire to blow out yeah. the emergency a escape. Stairway. Yeah. It's, like, it's worse than the fucking cryo tubes from Covenant. You know? <laughs> but I did have this thought that obviously, I you know, because Newman and McQueen were chocking for for possession of the film i literally believe that mcqueen walked up to a stairway and went smash and just walked <laughs> away if anybody comes down there they're fucked <laughs> but it was quite a nice little stunt as well having to climb down yeah. the broken yeah. the barrier trying it, to get the kids it's one to of my favorite well. sequences in the film because it's like you know you put yourself in that situation yeah and you're just like could i climb could i survive that mm. and you know you've got the great map painting underneath them oh yeah yeah uh, which just gives you that 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 scope of depth of you know the of height and falling yeah um, but there is you know the special effects in the film are fantastic yeah. from the from the two miniature buildings that they built yeah you know sometimes when you look at the fire bursting out of the windows the, the fire is burning too quickly yeah, and yeah. that's because it is a it's miniature a small, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it still it still works it's, it's it? still impressive with the the firefighters inside the building though there is a, a kind of like a glitch if you will, in this sequence where he's rescuing the small girl. Yeah. When they're coming down, you can see that Paul Newman and the girl become transparent for a few seconds oh, right. where the fire is coming right through them. And ah. that's because the, the, the matte painting yeah. Yeah. and the effects kind of Things went on top work. of each other. So it just becomes transparent only for a little bit. You know, the first time you're watching it, it just kind of maybe looks like the fire's reflecting off his coat. Yeah. But, it, but it's not. He's literally see-through. <laughs> he's on fire. <laughs> yeah. But otherwise, the special effects are, are really good. And you'll only notice small flaws when yes. you rewatch the film. There are a few other instances with the helicopter and on the scenic elevator later on where you can just go, it's obviously an effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there are so many other parts where you're like, wow, how did they do that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I found that a couple of times, especially with, like, with the dramatic sequences. Like, for example, Paul Newman climbing down the busted stairway. I mean, you know, I was really looking like, is that a stuntman? You know, because it probably was, you know, we, we we want you to do this moment. But then again, Paul Newman was still quite young at that point. And back in the 70s, they they weren't worried about doing their well, own both stunts. Both Steve McQueen and Paul Newman both wanted, and all of the actors in the film wanted to do their own stunts from jumping through windows and being set on fire and yeah. being blasted with water hoses. But a lot of the time, the studio just said no. Insurance. You you have you're gonna have a stunt actor, and so almost everyone had some. But Paul Newman and Stephen Queen still did a lot of their stunts together to yeah. the point where Stephen Queen broke his ankle Ooh. doing one of the stunts, had to go and put it in a splint and everything. And that's why there's a, a few sequences in the film where Stephen Queen's just sat down. 
with the other firefighters looking exhausted and that's because he had a busted ankle and couldn't walk properly. I thought that was just him just trying to get an extra scene in. Over, right. Over yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a difference between screen time and yeah. screen dialogue. Yeah. yeah. But there were about 200 stuntmen, I think, on there the There were, yes. There, so yeah. yeah. There were a lot of them. And actually, Paul Newman's son is in this. Is um, it his father as well? Um, I don't know about his father, but I know his son, Paul Newman it, Summers, he's a fire, firefighter. Fire, fire, he pays and, and, and he is actually a stuntman. Oh, right. he was because he died four years after that film. But <laughs> that was yeah. that, that was a great great scene actually. It's the scene where um, they they they're, they're using the elevators and the power cuts out, and so the firefighters decide that they've got to rappel down the elevator shaft using the ropes because they go get to the next floor. And one of the firemen, and I believe it's Paul Newman's mm. son, he turns and says, "I I just can't do it. I'm I'm too scared. You know, I, I'm I'm afraid something bad's going to happen." And McQueen, fight even fucking breaking. Where are you? No emotion or anything. Just turns to him and goes, "Well, then you go first, so you don't take any of the rest of us with you when you fall." <laughs> yeah, it's like you just got fucking told. You know, you're going to climb down. You're Paul Newman, son. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're not getting one more line over me, even if it does count towards your dad's. I can't make it. I'll fall. I know I'll fall. Okay. And you better go first. That way when you fall, you can take any of us with you. But we cut back to the 65th floor where the fire has spread to the office containing uh, Dan Bigelow and his girlfriend, Laurie. And, oh, one of the best sequences. You know, they've just finished having sex and they should get back to the party. And he opens the door and realises there's the fire mm. outside the office. Now... I, I don't know safety or things like that, but if you're going to close the door and try to stop the smoke coming in, sh couldn't you have just broken a window to give yourself more But he oxygen? does the right thing, tells her to get some like towels, towels and that, because yeah. that's what you do, isn't it? Is yeah. to stop yeah. the smoke coming in, you put towels yeah. down on the gap but, and underneath the door. But dear, you don't then go and pick up the phone and pretend to have an imaginary conversation <laughs> yeah, with somebody. He did that for her. Bullshit, he did it for it. We talked about this when we watched the film. He lies to her. He didn't want to scare her. There's yeah. a giant fire outside the office. I think that's more scary. <laughs> he lied to her that the firemen were coming because he didn't want to scare her. Doesn't at once tell her to get dressed. Doesn't bother to break I any of the windows. I couldn't believe she couldn't. She was like, oh, the firemen, you know, she believes the firemen are coming to rescue her. I'm just going to be rescued in my pants. <laughs> in my Actually, pants. <laughs> I've got a question here because I was trying to work out. Yeah. She's got tights on. Yeah. Right. I can't, is she even wearing pants? Because... I yeah, yeah, no, she is, she is, because there's a point where I saw her, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, <laughs> I saw her fall over just before she dies, and I was looking, I was actually <laughs> looking, and I'm like, oh yeah, she's, she's got pants on, <laughs> but it's the fact that, you know, he lies to this woman and says like, you know, firemen are coming, oh no, they're not really, I just said that to make you feel better, and then she's <laughs> like, well, okay, um, well, at least nobody's ever going to find out that we had an affair, and Robert Wagner literally gets this look over his face like, oh shit, yeah. Right, I'm going to slap some <laughs> towels on me and I'm going to run through this fire really, really fast. <laughs> what, you're going to leave me in this room on my own? I'm going to bring the fireman back to you. But we're on the 65th floor. I know, but I'm going to be fine. Don't you worry. I'm like, he's already lied to her. He's already been lying to his wife. He does not want to get caught in this room with her. And so he Rather goes... go out and die in the fire. <laughs> literally runs out into the fire and covered the towels in petroleum because those towels go up. They went up straight away. Well, no, the first thing he does when he gets like, you know, he looks, surveys the room. There are like gaps through and everything. First thing he does, runs straight into a chair on fire. Yeah. yeah. Sets himself on blaze. She then screams, oh my God. He falls through the glass. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. He, but he, he bumbles doesn't around window, for a minute. Does he? He's bump yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Like and then he falls the over office. the ledge in yeah. the office. And then she screams and goes to break one of the windows. And then yeah. the fire envelops and her goes. and blows her out the window. And I'm like, that was fucking stupid. <laughs> Do 
Yeah, it's still harsh, though. I mean, two people just died, and one just took a flight out the window. Yeah. It's just like, oh, damn. I felt really bad for her. Yeah. But I felt really bad for her for the situation that Robert <laughs> Wagner had fucking left her in. But then it's, it's, it's only about two minutes later where you see firefighters come into that, that room, room. Yeah. and put out the fire, or try to. <laughs> try to put out the fire. Also, continuity here, where, where the, the guy had fallen and broken the glass. It's now the fire has repaired it. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. She should have. She should have hidden out in the bathroom. Yeah, she what probably could have survived if because the, the firefighters were in there. Yeah, yeah it's totally. The shower but on. You never know, you know. <laughs> Like I said, it's it's having all of these situations with all these different people. We're supposed to feel for these people getting caught up, yeah. um, in the fire. But I mean, Poseidon Adventure did it really well. You had all those people in the dance room and then a small group mm. making their way out through the boat. So when the big group died, you were like, oh. Fuck, it's yeah. just these few people. In this one, though, you've got this large group of people in the promenade mm-hmm. room, much like Poseidon, and you know that something the fire is going to get to them, but it's taking so long, mm-hmm. and the firefighters are fighting it anyway, and we're losing more firefighters than we are normal civilians. You know, cause we, like I said, in that elevator shaft sequence, we get one of the firefighters just fall from the top. They know, I no idea what happened to him yeah. right there, but... One of ours. Oh, no, one of ours. You're yeah. like, fucking no, hell, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, it's one of our men. Oh, God. But Paul Newman uh, has finally made it up to the promenade room with the children and realises that, uh, you know, worst case scenario, somebody has poured concrete outside the fire door. And so they can't get into there. It just looks like the wheelbarrow has been turned over, oh, tipped over and yeah, abandoned. Just left. Yeah. yeah I mean, <laughs> you know, you can imagine the staff front, working up in there. In front of an like, We're on the very exit. top floor. Okay, let's just go home. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you take it down in the elevator? No, just chuck on top of the fucking stairs. It doesn't matter. This building's impenetrable. It's, <laughs> okay. it's like, it's light as spec. It's not going to catch fire or anything like that, so... With all that glass on the outside, yeah. all it takes is a sunbeam to set <laughs> off. I don't know, sometimes that glass doesn't look like real glass. It's it's Hollywood glass. Yeah, it's you Hollywood know, glass. You just press on it and it'll, it'll fall go. out. Yeah. <laughs> but then it's, as we get toward the end, the, the last hour of the movie, I suppose, <laughs> it's now the, the, the chopping of how many different escape routes we can send the people out. Um, so obviously, because the internal elevators are gone, and the the uh, stairways have been completely blown up through gas leaks. Paul Newman decides to cut the gravity break of the scenic elevator and send 12 people out there. But before they do that, they must take 10 of them up onto the roof because Steve McQueen wants to try and rescue them by helicopter, even though it's too windy up there and we've been told three times that the helicopter cannot land. It's not going to work. But he takes... Paul Newman takes 10 people up onto the roof and tells a bunch of them to stay back. And oh my God, the helicopter is like two seconds away from landing. And these two women in cocktail dresses just run up ah! <laughs> and scare the pilot so much. He smashes the helicopter into the roof of the building. That's all right though. The two women survive. <laughs> Did you notice that one of the women had knee pads on? So that when she falls down, she doesn't hurt herself. herself. <laughs> It's like, okay, right, so we can't go out through helicopter. And uh, and Paul Newman's just like, right, I'll, I'll do the scenic elevator. Mm. So he cuts Which the brake. Which they had been successfully putting people around until the power cut happened. And oh, that yes, right. yeah, that, yeah, And true. that's when they couldn't use it anymore, and that's when he came up with the idea. With cutting the gravity, mm. the gravity uh, brake. Because it did look a little bit weird. If I mean, if you miss the power outage part, it does look like this Paul Newman is just fucking with the elevator to try and kill some more people because <laughs> he doesn't tell anybody it's not like he says this is my idea he literally just walks off snips a couple of wires and goes hey everybody right we're gonna use this get into the elevator <laughs> you know and it's really ominous because the music the way people were saying goodbye to each other it might be the last time you ever see each other yeah. <laughs> and the elevator starts making it its way down there's a massive explosion and the scenic elevator which was the most Terrible idea to send people down the outside of a flaming building anyway, but hey-ho, 70s, what are you going to do? Um, becomes loose, and uh, Jennifer Jones' character is thrown out the top. 
<laughs> that was a sad death. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, she didn't she deserve saved, that. <laughs> no, she saved the children and she was a lovely lady. And you'd already gone through that tense moment of her climbing down the stairway. Which, yeah. yeah. Survived that. Yeah. yeah. But the thing that's harsh is that she's the one who hits the side of the building on the way down and then... <laughs> spins as she goes. Not, not good. It's still like, and she'd only, she'd just started to get close to Fred Astaire's character. Yeah, mm. yeah. You know, which had given Fred Astaire's character a bit of a, a lease on life. You know, she was, she was willing on taking care of him and now she's dead and you're like, out of all the people that died in the film, I, th I think that was, that the, was harshest. the harshest. Yeah. yeah, for sure. You know, um, definitely Robert Wagner's was the funniest. <laughs> but Steve McQueen at this point has gone, right, you know, fucking, I can't be outdone by Paul Newman rescuing all these people <laughs> by, uh, by by elevator. I need to get me a helicopter and I need to fly over and I need to hook it up on wire and I need to fly it back down to land. And so it's that, at this point I'm like, right, okay, now they're just jockeying forever who's the hero. Because at the same time, they, they've got a breacher's boy yeah. set up uh, from another building just over from uh, the tower, I suppose. And they're, they're sending people over one one chair at okay. a time but they've all got numbers yeah yeah they've all been issues with numbers at this point got, got to send the women and, and and children first and so it's yeah it's just literally them jockeying back and forth over the most dramatic sequences you know the helicopter yeah it rescues the elevator but steve mcqueen almost loses a fireman but saves him at the same holding time holding on to him by <laughs> ring <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know and it's after that that he is kind of sat there with the fireman just looking absolutely yeah. exhausted I, I really i like the sequence after he had rescued the the scenic elevator but the actual rescue of the scenic elevator i was just dumbfounded mm. at the <laughs> idiocy of the filmmakers here Why? <laughs> the elevator is attached to the side of the building yeah. Yeah, yeah. the helicopter flies in yeah so the midpoint yeah, is where, not where he's work. hanging exactly the helicopter blades would be inside the building, building. Yeah, yeah. and of course the film just doesn't show you no. that no otherwise no. the helicopter would have to be above the building and it, yeah and i'm just like no that's yeah, well, really I mean, yeah but didn't the building kind of it went up and then like that because i i got a bit weirded out by that it does well, yeah because because oh, it seemed but the like, elevator was already halfway down the building yeah, when yeah, they so. show the scenic elevator it looks like paul newman is watching well, it go is, down when, like, when you no see the chair do. going down the elevator is not even on the side of the building yeah. anymore it's so that continuity down, yeah. is just it's, it's, it's all about like i said <laughs> trying to jockey over to see who can get the most dramatic ending yeah because once they've gotten rid of all the women and children through the chair Richard Chamberlain has gone, you know what, fuck this. I've already tried to use the stairway to escape and that almost cost me my life. I don't care for anybody here and I'm going to go to jail for Not all even the... his wife. Yeah, I'm going to go to jail for all the terrible things I put on this building anyway. So you know what, I'm going to lead, lead a, uh, a rebellion against the chairs and I'm going to leap onto the chair. Against the chair. While everybody... I just... See, because he, get... he tries to convince all the other guys to hold on to the rope while he jumps onto the chair. <laughs> and then but they all decide <laughs> they all decide that they don't want to be left behind so they go to let go of the rope and then then uh robert vaughan comes up with his good guys telling them all to let go of the rope but then robert vaughan tries to jump onto the chair to try to pull rich chamberlain out yeah i shouldn't have done that Should yeah have just left him because it just becomes a massive huge thing and everybody ends everybody up falling dies. out the window yeah which was kind of sad and i did like the way that rich chamberlain died and kind of hit the building on the way down yeah as well you could yeah. kind of hear him scream like no <laughs> But now, the people who are left in the promenade have only about 17 minutes left to live. The fire is completely out of control. There is no way to save them. Unless some crazy bastard can climb up all the way to the water towers above the promenade room, plant C4 onto the side of them, and blow millions of gallons of water through the building to put out the whole entire fire. Yeah. There's only two men that can do this job, and one of them's just been sent to hospital. So guess who gets the luck? <laughs> oh, shit. Yes, that's right. Steve McQueen has got to save the day. But, because him and Paul Newman are jockeying for the top spot, <laughs> he's got to take Paul Newman with him. <laughs> now, as again, where I was just kind of dumbfounded by the film. <laughs> Because they get in the helicopter and fly above the building yeah, yeah. and he drops yes. Steve McQueen off onto the roof. Yeah. And I'm like, so you can now fly above the building? How about, yeah, 
you get some of those ladders that you drop from a from a helicopter <laughs> and, and taken, just pick yeah. everybody up off the roof of the building. Then you don't have to blow up the tanks and kill more people. No, wait a minute. That, that, that's a smart idea. That's so smart no, idea. let's not do that. Let's, let's not do that. We've got to have a big... Big dramatic ending. <laughs> big yeah. dramatic ending. So he slaps the C4 to the containers and then they have to race down the stairs. And I, I, I kind of like that cool bit where you had... You had uh, Steve McQueen in the fireproof suit pushing the the like the fire. door, the table onto the fire, which then gives space for Newman to come running down. Um, so that kind of works really nice. But then they get into the promenade room and it's like, okay, everybody, um, we're going to blow holes in the ceiling, which are going to let millions of gallons of water through the whole building. Okay. Um, that's actually a better option than us all burning to death. So, in all fairness, though, I'd go with that. Yeah, I don't know. I'd probably just smash a lot more of the windows and you know, just kind of rappel down the side of the building myself. But <laughs> I'm crazy like that. Um, so we're all going to tie ourselves to something to keep ourselves affixed into one position while the water all comes flooding down, you know. Um, and the thing explosions I mean, you kill more people in this final sequence through blowing the water canisters than I think. Anything else that happened in the building? This is when, though, this is the point. Because up, up until that point, I think the film's done pretty well in terms of not too bad acting or you know, yeah, yeah, no yeah. major. It's all, been on point. It's yeah. all being kind of pretty good. And then it's at that point that all the numpty extras appear. Yes. Um, <laughs> to Throwing to themselves. throw themselves around, deliberately yeah. around and stuff like that. And that's when it goes a bit like, oh, yeah, because they did you have to do that. <laughs> well, that, well, that was the thing. That, I mean, or it not seems, tying themselves up. <laughs> it seems like they all spread themselves around this room. Nobody actually said, oh, don't go near that yeah. corner because that's where the canisters are going to be. About stay away from the windows as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only one was, what's he called, the barman, uh, Carlo? Car or, Carlos, yeah. yeah. Whatever. And he says to him, why have you got the glass? Because he's got the crate of the really yeah, but, expensive wine and he's hugging it as while he's tied But doesn't he die because of he the does, statue He as dies well, because of the statue, not because of the wine. Yeah, the statue falls mm. on him, collapses on him. I'm like... Motherfucker, that guy died anyway. He yeah. yeah. should have just died with the wine. But, yeah, you have the explosions go off. There's people everywhere. The fires are sending people running. People are throwing themselves out of windows. You know, there's water smashing people in the face. I mean, I swear that the mayor just got hosed. Oh, yeah. Like, somebody <laughs> just stood and, like, we need to make it look dramatic. So, <laughs> And then I... The way it designed as well, I mean, the canisters are blown above the room. The water's come flooded into a room. And obviously, gravity, the water would have immediately just gone flying out the window. <laughs> right. yep. But no. somehow it went no, through the building. It's going, it's going through the elevator shafts. It's going through the stairways. It's managing to put out all the fires everywhere so that it's everybody is safe. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's so much water in those tanks to begin with that the sheer weight of that water would have meant the tanks would have just fell through the building yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway. <laughs> or the structure was so secure that actually blowing them up wouldn't have allowed the water to yeah. go down. You know, it's... They got that architect in and he's like, yeah, the, the promenade room should survive that kind of explosion. I'm like... <laughs> Depends how well they built it. Depend, <laughs> yeah, depend on the spec. Looking, looking at the rest of this building. <laughs> yeah. But we do have like the moral message at the end. You know, you've got yeah. you've got Duncan and his daughter. They're happy to be alive. She's upset because her upset, husband's upset, dead. Upset. He's happy the husband's dead. Um, but he promises to never yeah. allow this ever to happen again because, well, that's well, how good because he he's going to jail. Yeah, hopefully he, he's in trouble. <laughs> Uh, Steve McQueen and Paul Newman, they talk, and Paul Newman, even though he was planning on retiring, wants to make a building that goes up to all safety codes, and now he's got his best buddy, Steve McQueen, with him, and Steve McQueen knows fucking everything, you know, the two of them are going to make a massive, huge tower that won't collapse or set on fire or... Mm. You know, yeah, he has that very haunting message where yeah. he says to him, you know, one of these days, 10,000 people will die in one of these fire traps. You know, one of these days, you're going to kill 10,000 in one of these fire traps. And I'm going to keep eating smoke and bringing out body until somebody asks us how to build them. Yeah, and it's, it is harsh. And yeah. it was also an eerie coincidence that the final day of production for this film mm. was September 11th as well. Mm. And it's just, yeah. And, um, yeah, and the fact that the films were kind of I mean, the, designed the, on the, 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 the building. The books were based on the World Trade Center. Center. So, 
Oh, it's weird. Yeah. No. <laughs> but on a positive end note, yeah. everything's all okay because the cat survived. Oh, yes. The cat, the cat survived. <laughs> O.J. Simpson saved the cat and gives it to Fred Astaire. That's movie rules, isn't it? It is, but yeah. If it's not a dog, usually it's is a it? dog. Yeah. yeah. But they went one better and they chose a cat. <laughs> they chose the cat. I was a bit confused by that, though. So O.J. Simpson came down to that apartment, found the family, mm -hmm. rescued the mum. Yeah. Then went back up to the floor to see if there was any more people. There was another... He went back in there to rescue the daughter. No, the daughter had already been taken by Paul Newman yeah, at this Paul point. Newman. So O.J. Simpson's come up and found the cat when he in found Miss... the cat. I do really, he did find the cat. He, yeah, I just he can't did, remember yeah. which order it was in. Because he, he comes up and he finds the cat and says, oh, I almost forgot you. And O.J. Simpson seems to disappear for, for the, the rest, rest of the, the movie. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was it. And Miss Mueller does bring it up. She goes, oh, I forgot my cat. And the little boy says, oh, don't I'm worry, sure I don't think the fire got that far. And yeah, O.J. Simpson's taking the cat down. So yeah. It's all good. I think it's amazing how how well they captured this film. They shot over a period of four months. Mm -hmm. Wow! You know that's you know, it's a nineteen seventies film, so no CGI. Yeah, it was all camera trickery. Yeah, all camera trickery. What I find interesting though is that there were four production units all working simultaneously during the shooting of the film. So, the the named director for the film, which I said, is, is John Gilliman. Yeah. Uh, they also had another big director working on the film, and that was Erwin Allen. Yes, and Erwin Allen nice is known all, as yeah. the producer for the film, but it was Erwin Allen who was the one who wanted to get the book. He was the one yeah. who convinced the two studios to work together. Yeah, and he was the one who shot all of the fire action sequences in the film, and he was also the director for the Poseidon yeah. Adventure. Oh, I was about to say that. Actually, where you can see the link. Where you can see the link <laughs> yeah. because he brought all the development team that worked on that mm. film into this one and so yeah so he worked on all the special effects and it was the studio producers that turned to him and went no you cannot direct the entire no, film <laughs> we're gonna let somebody else have the name direct directional maybe, name for the film maybe yeah. that was it maybe he just tried to do too many similarities to Poseidon in well, he, he wanted to well, I mean he learned what he was doing there and just yeah. kind of honed his craft for the towering and yeah now. but I don't, but that's it I mean I I feel like like you could remake this film. I don't think it would be three hours long. Um, but you would you would honestly have to pick either following the people inside the building, or following the firefighters fire, fighting it. Well, there was trying a... to have both of them in it at the same time is it gets there, a bit too much. There was a made-for-TV movie which came out just before Towering Inferno called um, the really Ta tall fire. Terror on the 40th floor, <laughs> uh, which really did follow more about the firefighters than those that were originally trapped in the building. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, if they were to remake Towering Inferno, I would focus mainly on the, on a firefighting mm. team going through the building. Mm. But it was, Towering Inferno was up there, wasn't it, that year of one of the top grossing films? It was, it was the highest grossing it, film um, of the year. It grossed something like about 138, 39 million, yeah. as opposed to Earthquake, who came out month before, a month before yeah. which yeah. only was about 85 million yes, box yeah. office. So. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Towering Inferno also picked up, I think, three Oscars as well. Yeah, For yeah. cinema photography, for editing, and best Use, song. Yes, <laughs> not for writing. Not either. for the writing. <laughs> but what, which song? What, the song she sings at the promenade? Yes. Oh, my God. Which that, I that, believe, that won an Oscar. Didn't, didn't Fred Astaire want to do something? They wouldn't Probably, let him. yeah. They said, no, no, you can't do something. <laughs> that won an Oscar? Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> Oh, while we're here, let's leave a mark. There's a candle in the dark. So, favourite scenes, Ian? Mm. Uh, I've, I've got, I've got uh, a few. Um, one of my all-time favourite scenes has to be um, Robert Wagner's death mm -hmm. in The Office. You know, when I was younger, when I watched it, it was probably a lot more dramatic, a lot more mm. scary. But now watching it yeah. and being older, I'm just like, what the fuck was he doing? <laughs> you know, okay, yeah. Let's say we are stuck in a room, you know, and there's fire outside. And I say to you, oh, don't worry, honey. I'm just going to chuck some wet blankets on my head and run for it. You'd be like, no. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> you fucking not. You're not leaving me here. You know, and the fact that he literally just runs out and then hits something. On fire straight away and just runs around the room he doesn't even decide to run yeah. back into the no. room for her to save him keeps going he just keeps like he really doesn't want to get caught in a room with her you know <laughs> because it's really really bad you know i'd rather die out here looking like i rescued her my, my other two favorite sequences as well i i really liked the sequences between james duncan 
and the hero, I suppose. Like, like he he has his first confrontations with with Mike, the the fire chief, and and Steve McQueen has gone up there. He's wearing all of his gear. He's ready to walk in there and just start fucking telling people what to do. Which you know he has every right to. He's the chief of fire. But he takes off all the stuff to not be so scary, mm. which I thought was really cool. And then he walks in, he starts talking to James Duncan, and he starts he starts explaining to him really, really nicely that all these people have to get out because of the fire. And James Duncan's like, no, we're safe. The fire is not going to get to us. You know, we don't have to move. And, and, and Steve McQueen's like, I'm telling you, you have to. Mm. And if you don't, I'm just going to announce it myself and embarrass you in front of all these people. And James Duncan's like, well, I'll maybe I'll get the mayor. He outranks you. Hold it, hold it. The mayor's out there. Do you want me to pull rank on you? Well, there's a fire. I outrank everybody here. Bird. Mm. <laughs> but it was reflected as well later on when um, Paul Newman has his confrontation with James Duncan. And yeah. Paul Newman's literally just got up to the promenade room. He's absolutely knackered. He's rescued these children. And he's just got the phone call telling him that his buddy Will has died. Mm. And you'd seen Will and Paul Newman at the beginning. They seemed really, really close. And the fact that his buddy's now died, he's now going to break the uh, information to Duncan and says to Duncan basically there, like, we built this building together, but you did this. You caused this. You cut these corners. You didn't check up on all of these things. And like, like we said earlier, Duncan isn't really the bad guy. He's maybe made some bad decisions mm. which have led yeah. to bad, bad problems for other people. He was just greedy. He wanted all the money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he... But... And he doesn't pay for his crimes, really, no. in this film. Well, I mean, well, no, with the, but that's the funny thing, isn't it? Because he was the builder. He gave the job to his son-in-law and, and his son-in-law lied to him. Yeah. And said, yes, I've done everything up to code. But he cut corners in other areas that yes. we don't really know yeah. about. Yes, I mean, yes. the yes. doors yeah. are made of fucking flimsy plyboard. No no sprinklers. No sprinklers. The, yeah. the walls are coated in petroleum. <laughs> you know, there are like no extinguishers. Yeah, he yeah he cut a lot of problems. But I, I liked those uh, dramatic actor pieces. You yeah, know, you yeah. can talk about disaster movies, but when you've got like the actors acting on stage... Yeah. You know, delivering these lines, that's what makes you believe you're caught in the building. It's its that moment that I, I have a favourite moment there as well, when he turns to him and he says, what do they call people that kill people? Yes. And it's just the way he delivers that line in his reaction, it was just like, murderer. Yeah, murderer. <laughs> what do they call it when you kill people? So I've got a lot of kind of memorable scenes, I'd say, obviously, like you guys, but obviously you probably saw it on TV when it was first came out on TV. Yeah. I, I remember, you know, I love disaster movies. So yeah. it's a big one. It's very memorable. So there are certain scenes that stuck in my head yeah. as a, from a child that I remember. The the one at the elevator where they all get kind of burnt. Yeah. Although yeah. in my head, like you said, I, I, I'd envisage that being a lot worse than it actually, it is. actually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know whether that's just something I, my imagination, I created in my head that you could actually see of course, yeah. all the, you all know, the charred, bodies. charred bodies and everything like that. And you only actually really see the guy who comes out. Yeah. Um, so, so that, that was one, the, the Robert Wagner scene, obviously. It's great sequence. Um, the, the scenic elevator. Yeah. And yeah when that kind of one. comes, explodes, comes yeah. explodes and comes off and stuff and, and poor, What's called Lizalette. What he calls the kid Lizalette. <laughs> um, so, so scenes like that kind of uh, ones that really stuck in my head. Yeah. But I do like the moment uh, with Steve McQueen's character when he's just found out he's been talking to the. I think it's his chiefs, wasn't it? The officers that said this is what this is the solution. To no, blow, those, to were the the, they, yeah. those were the navy to guys. Those were the navy guys. Blow the tanks and like you said, there's only two people who can do that, and the other one's on his way to hospital, kind of thing. So it's kind of you. Uh, so you're gonna have to go there and and i think it's, it's the only time i remember hearing kind of a swear ish word and, it, and he just looks at the camera and goes oh shit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit you know yeah 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 um yeah for me you're the scenic elevator um all of the firefighting sequences i really Lo yeah. I, I wanted to be yeah. a firefighter after watching this film. I was like, <laughs> thought it you off. <laughs> no, no, I was just like, the, the, they were real heroes. They get C4. All of them, you know, they got yeah. C4, they got axes, they got fire hoses. You know, they're, they're, they're in charge. 
yeah. of, of the situation until the fire does get the best of them. And that was... But I just loved all of the shots of the firefighters. Just, just you know, even though they were defeated, yeah, it was still that they were so believable as extras that it brought you into the realism mm. of the film. Mm. And and that was something I got with this viewing this film this time as well was seeing all the firefighters there with like our firefighters. You know, they are funded by the government. You know, they are they are, they are paid to do this really really dangerous job to save these lives, but they don't get as much respect and admiration as they should do. You know, the government doesn't fund them as much as they should do. The towering inferno should have been a massive advertising for that, <laughs> saying, we need to give these firefighters more money, more equipment, more training, more this, more that, to avoid a giant firing inferno like this one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It should come as no real surprise that I definitely recommend The Towering Inferno. This is the film that got me interested and excited for disaster movies. Yes. And this is, you know, this film has all the tropes of a disaster movie, but in this they're all done right. This film is still impressive today. Uh, and when you watch it, it's incredibly engaging, thanks to Newman and McQueen. Mm. This is one of the best, if not the best, in the genre, mm. still to this day. So I highly, highly recommend it. Mm. Definitely, I, I'd say the same. It's one of the things I said to you, even I think we've all, we've, we've watched it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And I've, wa I've watched this film so many times. I remember, I, I seem to remember it used to be on at Christmas, around Christmas time quite often. Yes, yeah, yeah. But I haven't seen it for a number of years until we until decided now, to yeah. review it. Yeah. And then seeing it, I thought, actually, this, ho this, this holds its time. It does, yeah. It really it does. hasn't aged that much at um, all. And so, yeah, definitely, if you haven't seen it, Definitely, it's one of those films, the must-see films. I think it was in it still the is, top, yeah, yeah. like whatever yeah, top number of films, to, your see. films yeah. to see. You've got to see it. I, I definitely recommend it as well. I mean, I I don't think personally, I don't think it's as good as the Poseidon Adventure. <laughs> um, but then I like big boats. I'm a <laughs> Titanic fan, you know, and and I think Gene Hackman delivers himself better in that one. But I'm not talking about that. This one might be a little bit too long, with almost a three-hour long running length mm -hmm. um but it keeps its pace going you know it's it's like the fire is here in 15 minutes and it's in the background but we need to establish everything else for the next 45 then we'll get all the firemen in then we'll have all the dramatic set pieces then we'll have people dying so by the end of the film you do feel like you've been on a journey with the actors as well you're sweating and exhausted you're like fuck now i never thought i'd make it out of there <laughs> steve mcqueen and paul newman are both absolutely brilliant i i love the the back history that they were fighting for whoever had the most line or, or having the same amount of lines and yet they were actually absolutely best buds yeah, mm -hmm. you know they work really well on screen alone or or together you know uh the the background actors and actresses maybe some of their dramatic storylines could have been dropped a bit i mean did we need to see oj simpson rescue a cat <laughs> you know did Mrs. Mueller actually have to die? Robert it's a very Wagner. memorable death, so yeah. yeah. It is yeah, a very well, memorable yeah, death. They could have yes. given it to somebody else. I think it's more memorable because it happened to Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. But, uh, but someone else, you it would have been so impactful. Robert Wagner and his mistress in, in, in the office. It's, it's like you said, it's memorable. Did we need it? Yeah, I mean, it gives you more characters to care about or more characters that, you know, you, you worry about when they're in those situations. Because it's... They eat each pocket of the survivors that are in the tower you know each one you can identify with more or less with yeah so, so you're giving different groups of survivors that different people will relate to and, so and that is what makes up a disaster, a disaster movie. film yeah, right. yeah. that's what they do isn't it is that yeah. you you get you build on the different characters and and getting some sort of empathy or not or dislike yeah. for <laughs> certain characters so when they the ones you dislike die you're like yay <laughs> right. Right. but the ones you like they die you're like oh so oh, it builds that doesn't it sure. yeah 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 but at the same time you know for two two hours 45 minutes sunday afternoon yeah. you know can't go wrong no no <laughs> thanks for watching off the shelf reviews <laughs>